Welcome to the RF Elements Unlicensed Podcast. I'm your host, Caleb Nauer, and I'm joined with our other host, Tassos Alexiu. What is going on, Tassos? What's happening, Caleb? Uh, not much going on. What's going on with you, man? It's Friday here, right? Friday there. Oh, yeah. It's, yeah uh, the so... weekend is upon us, man. So it's, uh, it's a good day. It's a good day. Yeah. Um, I feel it in my veins, or maybe that's all the monster I drank right before doing this. So I don't know. A little column A, a little column B, but that's okay. I can't do that stuff, man. I can't do that stuff. I mean, I I, I like monster, actually. I like the sugar-free monster. That's that's what I drink, the white can. Uh, It's Mm -hmm. pretty good stuff. But I mean, I can only have like one every couple of days. I can't do it like every day or multiple a day. I mean, I like my coffee too, right? But I'm like a one coffee kind of guy in the morning and then I'm, I'm good to go at that point. I'm charged ready for the day. Well, you're about too high strung for me at half the time anyway. So it's probably That's a good true. thing. <laughs> oh, I've been messing around with these like super turbo, uh, espresso cold coffee drinks lately, just tinkering around here and they're great, but I can feel it killing me. So yeah, yeah, yeah. It's bad stuff, bad stuff. But anyway, all right. Well, today on this here podcast that we're trying to figure out how to make, uh, we've got a great episode. So we're going to talk a little bit about the history of RF elements, where the horns came from, you know, which is what most people know us from, and answer that age-old question of why exactly are we so horny? <laughs> but yeah, so we'll just we'll just go ahead and lay it down for everybody, uh, clear the air, uh, and make sure that we're on the same page. But before we get into that, uh, we've got a lot of things going on lately. What have you? seen flying across your radar either you know with us in general or in the industry so i mean uh, there's uh, it's very dynamics with things are always changing this week though <clears throat> there's been a, a lot of conversation about the radio shortages that are out there uh, radio shortages that are coming so a lot of discussion this week has really specifically been about uh you know the the ubiquity prism rocket prism radio becoming hard to get uh, some light beam uh, CPEs are becoming very difficult to get. So, you know, we've been spending, or at least I've been spending a lot of my time trying to, you know, give the WISPs out there some alternatives uh, for those particular radios. Like, you know, not not many people still know that the older first generation Rocket 5 AC light radio is still in full circulation. And actually it's in pretty pretty decent quantities available. Now, of course, it's first generation, no active filtering, no GPS synchronization. But the, the, the main point here is that it is 100% compatible with all of the AirMax CPEs that you're, you know, that you were using with your Prism, right? So it's a, you know, stop gap kind of thing. Um, you know, if you have a tower go down, right? I mean, you either have no internet to your customers, right? Or you maybe sacrifice and put up this Rocket 5 AC light in its place. Uh, until you can get some prisms, at least your customers come online, maybe their speeds are slightly reduced. I mean, that's fine. Something is better than nothing. And quite frankly, the performance is actually pretty good. We have customers all over Latin America specifically uh, that are delivering 100 megs with uh, the Rocket 5 AC light, specifically on our horns, because our horns kind of help with the noise rejection. So it may not have active filtering built in as a hardware standard, but the horns themselves help filter out a lot of that stuff. So the performance is really good. And it's, uh, again, uh, just a, a measure that you can use or an option you have. So. Yeah, and what's really nice about the twist port architecture that we use in our horns and stuff is it makes swapping those things back out really easily. So you get some prisms in stock, slap them in the twist port uh, adapter. Then when you go swap them on the radio, it's a simple twist and unlock, and then you get your other radios back on. Then you can take that AC light and go put it somewhere else. You know, use it as a subscriber unit, put it on the back of an Ultra Dish or something like that, real quick and easy. Makes for a mighty fine CPE device. So especially when you're trying to push long distance with these higher order modulation rates that people are doing that works really well. The um, other thing that I'm seeing sort of take off right now is our starter dishes using the ISO stations or even the C5X from Mimosa. People are using these starter dishes because it's a very clean install for a CPE device. The radio just basically snaps directly to the back of it. Uh, it's very, very cost effective and the RF performance is great. You know, we built those starter dishes to be a low cost alternative to other parabolic dishes out there or integrated CPE unit solutions, but we still keep the really high quality RF characteristics that we developed when we did like the ultra dishes and stuff. So simplify the mount, simplify the mounting architecture and stuff like that, but still really good RF performance. So those are really taken off and you know, we're pushing some, some verbiage out there in the wild so people know what that looks like. 
Yeah. And that, I mean, that also brings up another a good point out there as far as just shortage goes, not, not just using our starter dishes as a potential CPE, but it's also natively supports the round form factor radios from Ubiquity, the ISO station and the PRISM station, which again, the PRISM station round radio uh, is another good, uh, you know, step in or fill in for the regular rocket uh, five prisms that uh, people are using. And again, uh, they make uh, good uh, CPEs when you couple them with the ISO station. So there's a lot of, uh, with the starter dishes. So there's a lot of other options out there for you if you're looking for that, other than, of course, switching platforms, which is something people can do too. Uh, some people are getting tired of these uh, issues with Ubiquity, let's say, and they want to just change platforms. The twist port makes it easy to go from Ubiquity to all of a sudden Cambium, you know, with just a change of an adapter. It's pretty pretty simple yep definitely uh, so uh, other thing i've seen bounce across my plate here recently just because it's at the, the tip of my tongue is the new 2.4 gigahertz array sector yeah patch, and t- uh, pat- patch array sector now we, we talk a bit of smack about patch array sectors but <laughs> you know there are cases where it makes sense and 2.4 is a case where you know there's probably not going to be a ton of volume for us this is never going to be you know a huge moving product but it makes a lot of sense for those that are still deploying in 2.4 uh, for very rural areas, you know, very long distance clients, so you're trying to shoot through a couple trees here and there, sort of near line of sight. In these situations where a full blown, you know, mega dollar CBRS deployment doesn't necessarily make a lot of sense financially. So we've had a lot of interest in it. It is now hitting distribution. There are some in stock, um, and they're about to be a lot more in stock here uh, in the States at least. So that's exciting. We've had a very small, we've had a small but very vocal uh, contingency in our customer base looking for this so it's rocking and rolling and we're happy to have it out there yeah yeah the array sector line is something that i'm i'm very excited about as well because you know there are a lot of uh frequency bands that you know horns are just not practical in especially the lower frequencies right 2.4 being uh, one of those specifically the wavelength is too large meaning the adapter would be huge the antenna would be huge uh, not that it's not possible, but uh, it would it would require uh, a, a kind of total redesign of everything from the ground up in order to do horns in those frequencies, and and it kind of leans into you know CBRS and and us kind of you know starting to move forward into other frequency bands outside of five gig. So it's exciting for me to see that it's finally really really happening and it's really moving forward now. It's good stuff. Good stuff. Yeah, I really would like to see a 900 megahertz horn at some point, just so I've got somewhere to like park my truck inside still, of it. You still and see have them everywhere, man. Just, just look up at those big AT and T uh, towers and stuff like that. You got those big ass square horn looking things, man. Those long lines yeah. or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> Yep, yeah. So that's all six, but yeah, I think the mega ultra horn. One day, one day we'll have this. So. Well, good deal, man. So let's jump into the heart of our conversation here. We'll talk again, like I said, about the history. Let's talk about horns. You know, we're very known for our horns. Not that we don't do other things. You know, we've got a lot of dishes. We've got the array sectors that we're just talking about. And we'll flush these out in more details later on in further episodes. But, you know, the horns are our main bread and butter. And with that, you know, comes this whole, hey, we're a horny wisp. Let's, let's talk let's talk a little bit about the the horniness. And let's get, let's get horny. So... That sounds awful. Somebody shoot me. So, <laughs> yeah, you want to so go there? Horny. I guess. Let's, let, let's go there. Okay. Yeah. Well, what do you want to know about the the uh, hit horny history of our filaments? <laughs> so it makes plenty of sense. You know, when I'm I'm new to the company, you know, but I've known you guys for years, and it seems like it's always been there. But you know, where did this come from? And sort of where did it tie into? You know, what, what's the history of where did these horns come from? You know, yeah. you've got a pretty long history, but I think folks would be interested to say, you know, hey. You know, these, these showed up the, here with the symmetrical and then the ultra dish. And then where did the asymmetricals come from? So give us a walk down memory lane here on this beautiful <laughs> Friday. And let's, yeah. Yeah. let's so, talk about our horny history. Yeah, it's it's quite a long history. I mean, it's only been six years, but it seems like it's it's been it's been forever, right? So, you know, the, the original horns came out <clears throat> around uh, 2015, <clears throat> I believe. Uh, it was, uh, you know, we, we did the launch at uh, Wispa Palooza in Vegas uh, for the first time and kind of introduced the horns to the, the rest of the market it was kind of our coming out party for, for horns and stuff. 
So I got to know, like when you first launched those and put them up and everyone walked up to it, like what was the general reaction? Was it like, what the hell is this? Or you know, did people pick up the message kind of quickly or not? Everybody thought they were point to point antennas. They're like, wow, these are really cool microwave little antennas. I'm like, no, they're, they're sectors are point to multi-point. And they're like, no way. You know, what do you mean? What do you mean? They're sectors? I'm like, <laughs> you know, these, these are actual point to multi-point antennas. It just, everybody, you know, thought, you know, point to multi-point was long and rectangular, like a sector and everything point to point was round, like a dish. Right. So that was the initial uh, idea. And the first thing people thought uh, when, when they, when they, you know, when we first brought the horns to market, their visual perception of, of what it was all about. But, a, but a sector is supposed to be tall and heavy and have a whole bunch of like weird metal plates bolted onto the side and wrap it in aluminum foil and stuff like that. So how could this small, uh, lightweight, easy to deploy unit with this twist port thing, how could that possibly be a sector, right? Yeah, yeah, definitely. That was, it was very confusing. It was very confusing. And then, you know, they'd be like, oh, tell me more, right? So you'd start telling them because obviously it was, you know, eye catching and they're like, all right, naturally they want to know. But then when you start saying, oh, this is our 90 degree symmetrical horn and it has, you know, you know, 9.6 DBI of gain. They're like, whoa, 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 what? Wait, what? How much? I'm like nine and a half DBI of gain. And they're like, well, that's crap. That's nothing. I, I need 20 or 21 DBI of gain. I'm like, well, not always, you know, and the conversation start, you have to start explaining to them, you know, what's your deployment like? You know, a lot of these people were, you know, trying to connect clients at half a mile or less using 20 DBI sectors and stuff like that. And that's where all this noise comes into play and, and, and how we started, you know, kind of putting our message out there. It's like, well, if you have less antenna gain, you have less received sensitivity and therefore you also hear less noise and basically you improve your SNR. So that's kind of how that message all started and, and, and how we started, you know, putting it out there into the world. So you mean I don't want to hear the noise like five or eight miles away from my subs that are a mile away? Like, come on, man. That's, that's so counterintuitive. Uh, it, it, man, it, it took a long time to kind of really uh, educate and get people to at least start thinking about our concept of noise isolation. I mean, there's the whole thing between not having side lobes and all the other things that help us isolate against noise, but really having everything from 30 degree to 90 degree horns and 10 degree steps and at different gains is really another tool in the toolbox of how you utilize this. I mean, people still use you know, oversize or overgain antennas for much smaller distances because they think that's how you, you know, that's how you dominate noise is just by screaming over it, right? Or, or hearing over it and stuff like that. And it's really this, you know, noise isolation of not having side lobes. And again, the reduced, the reduced gain of the antennas uh, reduces the amount of, of noise you hear. So it's really, you know, it's really deployment specific, which antenna works, works best for you. And, you know, at first, of course, we were mocked, right? Everybody laughed at us. Yeah, it's not going to happen. <laughs> but I remember, I remember like our second year at Wispapalooza and definitely our third year at Wispapalooza where, you know, I, I, I'm really good at faces. I'm not the best with names all the time, but if I see a face, I remember it, right? So I remember for everybody that I talked to and I'm like an elephant in that way. I actually remember, you know, the majority of those conversations. And it was funny to see, the second year or the third year, because when people started using it, they wouldn't tell anybody, <laughs> you know? So like the second year you're at the show and you're out there with the same wares and, and you'd see guys kind of like walk by and like kind of look at you and like mm -hmm, walk by and then they, they, they kind of come back and they'd slowly ease in, right? And where they used to yell at you and say, you're dumb for thinking that this thing would actually work. And they're like, hey man, uh, you know, those horns actually work. <laughs> you know, they're like embarrassed to admit that, you know, uh, we were right and that uh, they, you know, they wish they would have listened earlier and tried it and stuff like that. So there's a whole, uh, whole evolution of all that stuff and how it went down. And then fast forward to this year. So I started in April 1st. So I don't know if that bodes well for me or not. We'll see. Maybe, maybe better for me than you guys. But, you know, we had the Dallas show, the Wisp America show, uh, like three weeks later. So I'm at the booth bouncing around doing my pitch. And everyone's like, man, your horns are awesome. You've really done all this great stuff. And I'm like, yeah, I definitely, I've been working really hard, you know, making sure that you guys are successful. So <laughs> got to, got to soak up a lot of that extra credit on that, which was pretty cool. But yeah, it's been pretty wild how the, the shift in conversation has been. So, yeah, I mean, it, it took a while, right? So again, there was a, 
there was an there's been an evolution or yeah evolution is that the right word yeah there's been an evolution of our message and and how we kind of uh you know send this information out there and educate wisps and and we try and change and tailor our message to help people understand it because everybody you know learns in a different way so you need different examples of how this thing affects you as a wisp to make it click in your head and people finally get it and, and people eventually want to try it and uh you know the evolution of you know how the customers uh you know didn't talk about our horns changing into always talking about our horns is, is a whole nother story as well right so you know at first people were you know i don't they didn't want to talk about it right a lot of them were treating it like proprietary information they're like holy crap this stuff really works if i tell my customer or my competitor knows about it then he's going to use it he's going to be able to offer the speeds that i'm so so people kept it you know like you know intellectual property for themselves right so that's mm -hmm. was the first kind of generation of people out there in social media with the product and then eventually it, it got out to the masses and everybody wants to talk about it and everybody's posting pictures and everybody's proud of these 12 24 and even like 30 horn installations and that's kind of where the the horniness thing kind of came from and and how that evolved into you know the social media sphere of uh, everything in our marketing you know yeah and then you know they learned too that they didn't have to be afraid of their competitors using it because the more their competitors use horns and everyone's cuts back on all that noise just being squirted all over the place with these noisy sectors yes. you know it only helped everyone so yeah, exactly it was exactly. one of those where uh all floating boats blah 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 everyone does better so yeah and it's it um, funny because everybody back then you know they used to complain that nobody wanted to frequency coordinate with one another and really the truth was, is even if they wanted to frequency coordinate, they couldn't coordinate because all the side lobes, all the noise, there was just no effective way of really doing that. And now the precision of our antennas with no side lobes and it, it actually only goes kind of where you point it, you actually are able to frequency coordinate with your competitors and stuff. So it actually not only makes it possible, but uh, people realize that, uh, you know, they both win when they play well with each other like that. Definitely, definitely. So the symmetricals were first, uh, obviously, and then we went through a second generation, mechanical improvements and things like that. We're always mm -hmm. always tinkering with things, making it better. Uh, and then the Big Daddy Ultra Horn was somewhere in that in that middle phase, which mm -hmm. I'm a huge fan of the Ultra Horn. It's pretty cool. The Ultra Horn rocks, um, man. <laughs> it's an extreme measure, but by golly, sometimes you got to swing that big stick. So. Yeah. Uh, and then the asymmetrical sectors came out and I think that's really what sort of drove that, that coincided with the big boom in popularity, uh, especially with the, the wisps that were not necessarily dealing with the really small ranges or the really high density, but that's that sort of middle ground where, you know, your ranges are not, not extreme, but you know, definitely not, you know, quarter mile and stuff or half mile or whatever it may be. Um, and the densities weren't super high. So what did, what did, what do you see the asymmetrical sector sort of doing for the, the next leg of what the horns were doing? Well, they, I mean, they kind of serve two purposes, right? So <clears throat> there was, you know, the, the symmetrical horn really is the smaller symmetrical horns really is a, a, a an antenna for really high density. Not that you can't achieve that with the asymmetrical, but that was really kind of the, the, the first generation and, and how those things worked. We had a huge portion of our customer base or potential customer base out there that just didn't need that density, right? They, they had longer distances to cover, with less customers in a wider angle view, right? So, you know, they needed basically a sector, right? They needed that type of coverage. So that's where the asymmetrical uh, horns come into play with a, a much higher gain at a much wider beam angle than its symmetrical counterpart, right? So, so really, this really helps go out uh, into those areas. Now, <clears throat> what we're finding, right, as again, radios evolve you know the antennas need to evolve with them to be able to you know match their requirements these higher modulation rate radios actually require more antenna gain right uh, because people still are trying to kind of push the limits of their coverage areas and stuff like that so you need you know antennas with more gain it just helps that ours have no side lobes so we're again at least focusing all that game and that receive sensitivity in the direction that you actually need it so so it, it kind of plays uh, two things in there you know 
Yeah, and it's definitely what I see it as, is kind of the best of both worlds. Now, you know, there's different ways to deploy, and this is why I think our link calculator, uh, that you will hear us, we will fly that link calculator flag a lot <laughs> during this, long. and All basically everything we do. I may need to get a big banner back here on the on the wall, this empty wall back here, but... You know, the, the link calculator allows you to look at your coverage areas, look at your multi-CPE layouts, place your CPE, see where your, your pattern is going to be, the modulation rates that you're going to pull for a particular client, and do things like play around with the down tilt. You know, a lot of people aren't used to utilizing down tilt as a tool. They were just like, hey, we need to get it just down enough to hit our clients. Well, with the large elevation cuts we've got on the horns and the different versions, depending on the different horn, there's a lot of stuff you can really do with those and do uh, wide coverage areas and really hilly terrain, mountains and stuff like that. So play around and, and you know, used to down till two degrees max, maybe three. Well, we're talking horns. I mean, we can roll 10 or more. So run that link calculator, play around with it. If you got any questions, reach out to us. We will walk you through it. We spend a lot of time doing that because once you figure that out, then you figure figure out the bulk of you know what the RF planning on this looks like for sure. Yeah, link calculator is a great tool. <clears throat> We've spent a lot a lot of time and it's you know we always push that it's a calculator not a planner but you know over time it's it's starting to grow into actually being a kind of network planner. Um and we spent a lot of time not only developing it, but, but trying to work with the radio manufacturers out there, because that's a, another thing, you know, you can go into kind of a generic link calculator and kind of put, you know, your TX power, your antenna gain, and it'll give you the, the basic, um, the basic distances that you can run based on basic link calculation. But we actually work with Mimosa. We actually work with Cambium. And we recently were able to work with Microtech to kind of get the detailed receive sensitivity data that we need for all the different MCS rates that the radios are capable of uh, operating in. So that way now with that data, we can give you highly precise uh, and actually it's, it's, it's extremely accurate what kind of distances you're going to get, where the MCS levels start to drop from, you know, the highest modulation down to low modulation and, and plot that all out on a map. So it's, it's extremely useful. Um, and it's, 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 it's very beneficial for, for customers to learn how to use that tool and, and go give it a try. Definitely. You want to use it. You want to use it for sure. Definitely. So that said, let's talk about getting horny. So <laughs> the first time, I went to a trade show and came back with one of the shirts. It was one of the, when the first, uh, are you a horny with shirt came out. So a yeah. little background for those that don't know me, I'm a bit of a large fella, a uh, little girthy. And you know, I come back from these shows and you know, I got a handful of t-shirts, the ones I think are cool, but most of them don't really fit, you know? So I ended up just giving my wife for sleep shirt. So she's got like trade shows from across the world full of companies and languages. She has no clue. So I came back and I was unpacking my suitcase. I was like, babe, here's this new uh, shirt for you. And she looks, she's like, are you a horny wish? She's like, what the hell is this? And at the time I'm like, I don't know. They, they make horns or whatever. So fast forward a few, few years and now I am super horny. So where did, <laughs> where did that come from? Uh, uh, the, and then like the, the whole, uh, the horn, the plural version of the story that you told me is actually super interesting. So, yeah. Yeah. So, so I, I mean, it, on social media, it all started with a customer. What really wasn't us. There was a customer out there that had deployed whatever, you know, eight or nine horns uh, on his tower. And uh, he was super excited about it. We were super excited about it, right? To, to see people actually, you know, doing the things we said that you could do uh, with our horns and stuff like that. And he's just like, hey, I'm a super horny wisp. Check me out, you know, whatever. And we're all, everybody started <laughs> laughing. Was like, that's, that's pretty funny, right? The, the, uh, the ironic thing there is that, you know, we had recently internally been talking about, you know, some catchy marketing, whatever, and, and that the word like, hey, horny wisp had, you know, had come up uh, in, in our conversation. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, in a lot of our team meetings and team calls and stuff, it's pretty much done in English, no matter where we're at. But every once in a while, they switch to Slovak, you know, and I've been there a gazillion times and stuff. And and I, I hear lots of words, right? Mostly, you know, I know a lot of the cuss words, obviously, um, but there are other <laughs> words that, you know, that just that just stick. And, and I remember always hearing horny, horny, horny in a lot of conversations. And, you know, long story short, horny is just plural horn, 
right? So it's more than one horn is horny. So that's how we, you know, kind of said that maybe we should use that. And somebody obviously beat us to it and kind of did it. So we, there was really no debate at that point. It kind of took off to, to so to speak, go viral in the industry. And uh, yeah, that's kind of how the horny wisp, uh, you know, uh, came to be, I guess, you know. Yeah, that's funny. No, I get it. I mean, it makes total sense. And, you know, definitely a lot of our marketing efforts are a little tongue in cheek. Sometimes we get a little froggy with it to sort of push. So it is funny, though, you know, doing presentations like for our sort of standard customer base. I mean, we're both very casual folks. And you know, most of us, in the, you know, we're, we're super serious about the work we do. But at the same time, you know, just super casual about our talking and conversation. You can see that here. But there are times where I'm doing a presentation. I'm like, mm, this one's a little stuffier, a little corpo. So I'm let me control F through this presentation, make sure it doesn't actually say horny in here somewhere. So, <laughs> yeah, I mean, quite honestly, I mean, horny is not that bad, right? It's not that dirty or that edgy and stuff like that. So, I mean, it's, it's kind of a, it's a, it's a light edge to, to be, you know, to be used compared to, you know, some of the cuss words we've used in uh, some, of <laughs> some of the bracelets we have. And <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So we'll get into that some other point. So, yeah, yeah. Well, that's I cool, man. So. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah, I got a sack of them here that I need to start spreading out. But, yeah. um, well, cool, man. No, I think uh, this has been a very informative little chat here, kind of about the history, where things came from, where some of the, the funny parts of things came from. So getting people learned up, educated about what we do. And I think that's a real important part of what we're trying to do with this podcast. You know, super casual format very informal and we're gonna flex around with it and a uh, big part of what we want to do with this is get feedback from you know folks out absolutely. in the wild hey, absolutely absolutely you know, we want to know you, we want to know what you want to hear right what you want us to talk about you know what we should you know be uh, shedding more light on uh, in the industry as a whole you know it could be uh, you know, something from the equipment side, it could be something from the legislative slide side. I mean, wh whatever it is, we, we want to know, we want to know. Yeah, we can, you know, toss you especially have the, the gift of gab. So, I mean, we can both bounce up here and just talk about whatever we've all been doing this a little while. So, you know, we can get up here and just run our mouths the whole time, but yeah, let's, you know, you guys let us know where should we focus? What are we going to point at? Uh, we're going to start doing guests at some point here. So bring some folks on, share uh, your story talk about things that you've run into or crazy stories from the field. I don't know. Maybe we'll have some crazy ass story segment or something. So let's, let's figure out what's entertaining and which you guys no. did the crazy, no. the crazy story segment. <laughs> we will have to sort of screen those. Right. So take a, take a few takes. So we'll have a, maybe we'll have a PG version and an after dark version. We'll figure <laughs> yeah. that out. RF elements after hours, after dark. So, <laughs> Well, that's cool, man. So I think it's about time to wrap it up here. You know, like you said earlier, it's Friday. We're both getting a little jumpy to get our weekends going on. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. I know. I've been I've been doing the math, trying to figure out what I'm going to cook this weekend. I've been on this big barbecue cook. I always have, but lately especially, I've, I've gotten a little bit more keyed up. Maybe maybe the competition has kind of got me stirred up here a little Ooh. bit. So. Um, <laughs> So, but then trying different stuff too. So I've tried, uh, what is it? Oh, the smoke and then fried wings. I've tried that a time or two and it never worked out, but I'm going to try something different. We're going to smoke them and then dry them off real good and hit them with a flash fry and then the sauce and stuff. I think hmm. Hmm. may give that a shot. Maybe do a mac and cheese. I don't know. We'll figure something out. I'll yeah. I've been looking, I've been looking into the frying thing, man. I've been watching some, you know, cooking shows and stuff and, Man, I've just been seeing these killer like chicken sammies and everything that people are making up some fried chicken, fried fish, fried shrimp. I mean, fried up every way. And, you know, I'm kind of, um, you know, uh, habit forming, right? You know, I'm, uh, I have an addictive personality on some of the things that I do. Like I got into smoking, it was just all about smoking. You know, there you saw me go into my sour bread baking phase, you know, so <laughs> went, went through all of that stuff. I went through my griddle phase and, and, and you know, I, I jumped back and forth and sometimes incorporate both right uh, into it. But frying is just something I'm just like, mm, I don't know. I see a, a, a deep fryer being purchased in my future. And, and maybe you'll start seeing some of that on my social media stuff, some fried, some fried goodies coming up, I think. I think that's where, oh, where I might go. Where I might uh, go. This is this is not where my heart needs to go, but I'm kind of right there with you. I was <laughs> I was sitting on the sofa on my laptop the other night looking at one of those big fancy stainless steel outdoor deep fryer setups, one of those four gallon rigs and stuff from uh, Bio yeah. Classic or something. So I'm looking at it, and getting all excited. My wife walks up behind me to ask me something, and she's just like, "No, 
no, we're done. No, no, we've got enough stuff outside. No. And I'm like, well, well, I am kind of running out of space. And if I keep this up, I'm going to be a uh, heart attack broke, but I don't know. It keeps me amused. So yeah. I also saw some cat was griddling. They were, ta- what was it? It was absolute garbage food. Oh, they were taking sausage patties, frying them up, dunking them in pancake batter, and then making pancakes out of them. And I'm like, man, I don't know if I've gotten to that point in my life yet, but we'll uh, see. We'll see. Yeah. I'm like, yeah. That's pushing it. That's definitely, that's, definitely pushing it right there. I don't know. Depends on how much uh, liquid brain power I pick up over the weekend. We'll, we'll see how things go. So. <laughs> All right, man. Well, thank you for everyone listening to us. You know, this is new. We're trying to figure it out. Um, to those of y'all that are still here, we absolutely appreciate it. If you want to find us, we are all over social media. Uh, we have the RF Elements Facebook group. Uh, we have or the Facebook page. Then we've got the RF Elements English uh, Facebook group, which is big. We've got RF Elements Espanol. We've got RF Elements Asia, which we just fired up as we get more and more inquiries from that region. Uh, we've got our YouTube channel where we put out tons of informative educational content there. We've got our website, ton of good info there. Um, and we're just, we're around. So you guys let us know again, anything you want to hear, let us know any feedback and we will greatly appreciate it. Yeah. We're not hard to find. We're out there. So until next time, everybody stay horny. All right. Y'all be good. Stay horny.